Good morning, Build. Oh, that was wow. nice. That was, was healthy. really good. I feel like everybody went to bed early. So encouraging. Must be nothing to do here? I guess so. Nah. Mm -hmm. Not enough parties. Well, there's a party tonight. Who's going to be there? Well, that was really sad. My goodness. <laughs> I don't know that I would have go anymore. I was going to go. There's a party tonight. Who's going to be there? Yeah. Woo! That was so much better. I do appreciate it. It's 10.15 in the morning, so it's, it's hard to get going. Even I'm struggling. It is. It is. Well, we want to welcome you to VS Code Can Do That, our session this morning. And before we get started, I'd like to tell you a little story. I'd like you for you to go with me back to the year 2012. The number one song on the radio is Rolling in, in the Deep by Adele. She didn't write the song, she remade the song. It's tremendous. Number one movie at the box office is Drive with my favorite Canadian, Ryan Gosling. What a fabulous gentleman. Yes, Ryan Gosling, amazing. Never made a bad movie. Barack Obama is president. In this same year, Microsoft releases a small press announcement, press release. Nobody sees it. Nobody reads it. And it says that they've hired a gentleman named Eric Gamma from IBM. And Eric has been set up in Zurich, Switzerland. He's got a new office there. He's got a new team of people. And that's all the press release says, which is odd because Microsoft doesn't normally issue press releases when they hire someone and those people, that person hires other people. We have to switch over. Are we good? No, nope, oh, I'm what, projecting. What do I do? Press the button. I'm in the middle of my story. I'm on the slides. Let me click the slides. It's so early for AV. AV helps. <laughs> Jiggle the gas, which we need to do. Reboot. So wait a minute. You're still in 2012. Stay with me. And this team begins working on something called Project Monaco. That's what it's known as. And Project Monaco is designed to enable developer tooling in a browser setting. No. And it begins to show up in some very interesting places, uh, namely the IE11 developer tools. Um, also places like the OneDrive. All right, slides are working. Thank you so much. Big hand for this guy right here. Thank you. That's the best demo you're going to see all day. I'm sorry. That was it. Six. Okay. Uh, Visual Studio Online. And we toggled one. There we go. Visual Studio Online. So all of uh, the browser tooling here. Uh, but then Project Monaco begins to uh, make its way into a much more well-known product, John. Did you just call it Monaco? Monaco. I called it Monaco. <laughs> Let the record show. Is that like Morocco? Morocco, Monaco. All right. So it got into these products here, which was around for a while. Uh, it's basically allowing us to have editors online. And there was other tools that also took advantage of this product. But there was a lot of great discussions within the VS Code team, which now we call the VS Code team, about where should there be a tool that we can use for the web development and for other products. And a lot of people talk about editors and IDEs, and there's a spectrum of these. And there's lots of great products out there. There's WebStorm, there's Sublime, there's Atom, there's Vim, there's Emacs. There's so many great products. Visual Studio, uh, IntelliJ, they just go on and on and on. And what are people super passionate about at their offices? Their editor, their tool. Nobody wants to switch what their tool is. So on the spectrum of these things, you figure like an editor is kind of like classified as lightweight, it's super fast, support lots of languages, you can get in and out real quick. Not only is it fast to use, but it's fast to install and it's fast to load and it just does things super quick. It's very centered around all sorts of different workflows and it's generally keyboard centered. IDEs, like Visual Studio or IntelliJ, they do a lot of great things. They understand so much more. They're usually larger, a little bit slower because they do a lot more things, but everything's usually accessible through a click of a button. Hey, like, let me go get your coffee for you, right? So on this spectrum, where do they want to kind of fall? This is what the team was discussing. They kind of fell mostly over to the editor side but with a little extra magic. And you can see kind of how they brought in the different pieces 
of the puzzle from editors and IDEs. So VS Code, I like to think of it as an editor with a little extra power. And today we're gonna to show you some really simple things and some more complex things which we think you're all gonna really appreciate uh, using in VS Code. And by the end of this talk, we're hoping you're all gonna say, yeah, VS Code can do that. Right? Yes. One of the things I love about this slide is VS Code, we think of it as a text editor, but you need to think of that spectrum as a slider. You can actually take a slider and move it across that spectrum. You can turn VS Code into as much of an IDE as you want it to be, or just make it a simple text editor. The choice is yours. And the man, the myth, the legend, one of his quotes that I love here from the original release of VS Code, it combines the simplicity of a code editor with what developers need to do their day-to-day -day jobs. Eric Gamma created this tool along with Chris Diaz and a bunch of other great people on the VS Code team. Yep. So we take these three pieces that they use to put it together. Mon Monaco or Monaco? Mon what did you call now? Monaco? 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 Monaco. 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 All right. That's, that's the right way. <laughs> we take these three pieces that runs with Electron, which allows us to have the desktop-like experience inside of our tool. Other great products also use Electron. And then TypeScript, the TypeScript server in this case, helping us get all sorts of great coding features, even when we're not using TypeScript, we're using JavaScript. So we take those pieces and we put those together, and what we end up with is Visual Studio Code. Burke. That's right. So Project Monaco now powering Visual Studio Code along with the other pieces you've seen here. But the reason I told you that story about Eric in, in back in 2012 is because Eric is very famous for something else. They didn't just hire a guy. They hired a guy with some experience. Does anybody know what Eric was part of creating prior to Visual Studio Code? Gang of four, but that's not what I was looking for. I do have a Google cluster for the right answer. Who said it? I heard it. Somewhere in here. Say it loud. Eclipse. 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 That's right. So the same person who brought us Eclipse has now brought us Visual Studio Code. So the reason why they hired Eric is because he had the expertise and the knowledge to create developer tooling. And now, as Paul Har Harvey would say, you know the rest of the story. That's right. So my name is Burke Holland. This is Visual Studio Code can do that. Um, I'm also known as, you might also know me as who? Never heard of him. <laughs> and you are. And I'm John Papa. I'm just a guy who gets to stand next to him and we look alike, so that's kind of good too, right? That's right, you get two bald guys for the price of one. I so. think our pictures are up there, right? Lucky you. Oh yeah, next slide. There's me. That's Or it's me, either way. And then there's. We're interchange, yep, that, there we go. You got both of us. Everybody needs a doppelganger. It works out great for meetings over Skype. All right, so let's move right into it. By the way, before we get started, as Burke's cranking up here, we have, I think, just a couple tips to show you, like 90. So we're gonna try to get through all these in this time. And I've got a bonus one at the end that I just learned about this morning. Really? Yes. I'm scared already. Nothing like preparing a demo five minutes before you get on stage. How do I toggle? Is it one of these buttons? No, here? don't press those. There's a red button. I'm gonna press the red <laughs> button on the desk. That's me. That's you, and there we go. Oh, perfect, all right. So the first thing that I want to talk about with everybody here. You have a blank screen. <laughs> is my blank screen. Wiggle your you'll always, You will all enjoy, what's that, my cable here? That's me. Can VS Code fix the screen? Ah. Uh, no. Now we jiggle the cable, here we go. Unplug, replug. Let's try that. <laughs> Believe in yourself. Be a better person. <laughs> be all you can be, Burke. <laughs> nope. I don't think VS Code can do that. VS Code cannot fix projectors. Why don't you go over to your machine here, John? Well, yours broke. Don't touch mine. I know. <laughs> <laughs> You're next. All right, so the first thing that I want to talk about with everybody is themes. Now, you're aware that Visual Studio Code can do themes. I'm sure that everybody already knows that, but I want to talk to you about a couple of different things that you can do with themes. So the first thing is, in our themes here, um, you may know or you may not know that there are two kinds of themes. There are light themes and there are dark themes. I personally, as you saw my, my VS Code instance flash by in a second, I use a light theme. I like light colors. I like a light theme. I use a theme called Hop Light. Now, I've been told that using a light theme is not good for your eyes, according to science, but it is 2018, and I'm not allowed, about to let science or facts stand in the way of my perfect editor setup. 
Uh, John prefers a dark theme here, and he's wrong, and that's okay. Um, but he is using one called Winter is Coming, which is a fantastic theme. I'm going to give you some others that are also very popular. One is called the Adam Dark theme. It's very popular. And then there's one, let's see, do you have Cobalt 2? You don't have Cobalt 2 installed. There's one from a guy named Wes Boss, and it's called Cobalt 2. And Cobalt 2 is interesting because it is actually the best theme uh, according again to science for your eyeballs. And so what it is is a dark blue background with bright yellow text, and that is supposed to be easiest for you to look at. Did we fix my uh, Try it. display here? You gotta hit, what, what button do I hit? I think the button's right there. There's Cobalt. Ah, there's Cobalt too. I'm gonna try real quick. You're there, and then you disappear. And then I'm gone. All right, I hope you enjoyed that. All right, this so. This fun. Let's go to Cobalt 2. Okay, our video guy. Okay, thank you. See our themes here. So we installed a theme. Here's Cobalt 2. All right, so he's got, already got it loaded here. And let's just take a look at some of the files that we've got inside of here. Let's go here. John, I can't navigate your code. There we go. Uh, so you can see that we have sort of a bright yellow text on a dark blue background. Let me do that for you. Okay, go ahead. Right. Go ahead. Are we good? Yeah, he's going to get another cable for you. Okay, perfect. Uh, another thing that you will want to do for your VS Code installation is you're going to want to tweak these icons over here to the side. So let's go ahead and uh, collapse these here. There we go. So you can see we've got a bunch of different icons over here for our files. Let me zoom in on this. You can see we've got some, some Angular. You do Angular? A little bit. Does anybody know that? Okay. I don't think so. Uh, but the, the icon theme that most people use is quite popular. It's called Material Icons. Uh, and Material Icons is really, really neat because there's a different icon for every file type. Um, so for instance, if we added a file here, so I'm just going to add a file to this folder. I'm sure you'll be fine with that, John. Oh, yeah, no problem. I've completely broke your demo. So like a pug file, and look what we get. Yeah. Everybody wants to write pug files now just so they can have a bunch of pug faces in their editor. I like to add just different file types just to see what the icon is. Like, do you need Docker? No, but I want to know what the file icon looks like, so I'm going to use it now. So material icons is another very, very popular editor theme. The other thing that I want to talk about when it comes to uh, the appearance of your editor is something called font ligatures. Who in here, by a show of hands, has heard of font ligatures? All right, so a decent number of people, a decent number of people haven't. If you haven't, it's totally fine. Font ligatures are fonts that take symbols that we use in programming, because we use a lot of compound symbols, and it turns it into a single symbol. So do you have font ligatures installed on this machine? I don't, but you can turn it on. Do you have Ferricode installed on this machine? Yes. OK, excellent. So what we're going to do first is you're going to go, and you're going to go to uh, download a font called Ferricode. Now, you won't remember this. It's OK. It's in the slides. And Ferricode is uh, an open source font. It's on GitHub. You're going to download it. It's a true type font file. You're going to double click it. Hope to God there's not a virus in there. And then it's going to be installed to your machine. Now, once you have the file, um, let's see. Have you added this to your user settings already, John? Nope. OK. So what we're going to do is we're going to come down here to the bottom and add in a couple settings here. So let's do first, let's do editor.fontfamily. I did that. Oh, you already did that? Yep, is I did not there? do ligatures, so. Yeah, OK. So and then we're going to do editor.ligatures. Where is it? See, when you can't find a setting, you can come over here to the side and just search for ligatures. You have to know how to spell ligature, right? That's true. Font ligatures right here, we can just say yes, set it to true. It automatically gets copied over. I don't know if everybody saw that right there. Move this out of the way. There we go, true. And then we'll save that. And then once we save that, our font ligatures are enabled. Now, it doesn't look like anything here, but when we go back to our settings, so let's go back to uh, this TypeScript file here. And let's do something like we have a new function. Uh, we'll just call this function uh, bald. That looks good. And then this, and then we'll do a double arrow. And when we do that double arrow, you'll see that turns into an actual double arrow. right? And the same thing works for like if you have a double equals, you get an actual double equals. If you do a triple equals, because in JavaScript, we need three equal signs, equals, 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 you get an actual triple equals. So this is what the code team uses. They use font ligatures, and it just makes for a very, very nice uh, development experience inside Can of you. Can you do four equals? You can do four equals, but then you actually get four equals, Aww. which is a little bit disappointing. Uh, you can do an arrow like that. That works, right? So you can just, now you want to use font ligatures and see all the different things that you can use. So those are font ligatures. The other thing that I want to show you in terms of appearance is in your user settings, you can change the way that your cursor looks. 
So let's go to cursors. Cursor. There we go. See, it says editor cursor styles blank. So we can change this to something like phase. There we go. And then let's come over here. John, from your theme, I can't see your cursor. It's there, but you can't see it. Look at that. Let's That's not this. my theme, dude. That's Cobalt's. That uh, let's move it. Winter is coming. <laughs> Best theme in the world. You got to download it. Are we good? He's going to try to fix yours. Okay. Just keep going. Cool. So you can change the, uh, the cursor style you have. There's a phase style. There's a blink style. There's an expand style. So these are all the different things that you can do to tweak the appearance of uh, your editor to make it your own with your themes, with your font icons, with your font ligature, or excuse me, icons, font ligatures, and the cursor style. Yes. All right. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So what do you do when Burke touches your machine? You immediately undo everything he did. Sorry, Burke. That should be a command in Git. Like, it should just be out of the box. There should be some Git integration VS Git Code. dash Burke. If only that Burke. existed. So something I want to show you is if you go to codevisualstudio.com, something not a lot of people know, or maybe you know it, but you haven't tried it yet, is when you go to the code website, one of the best kept secrets is that you can download this with a stable build, which probably most people do here. But there's also an insider's build. How many people here use the insider's build? Can I see a show of hands? That's a good amount, but the rest of you haven't tried it yet. I'm going to tell you the reason I use insiders, and I use it every single day, and I've used it every day since it came out, is because with insiders, you're generally getting nightly builds. They're very, very stable for me. I've had maybe two days in the last three years where it didn't work total, and I flipped back to the stable, is that you can have stable insiders side by side, but with the insiders, you're getting almost daily updates of new features. And some of the things we'll show you today are actually only in the insiders, which is pretty wicked cool, including the bonus at the end. So if you want the insiders, you click the button, you choose, hey, I want insiders, comes over here, and it takes a really long time to download, like eight seconds, uh, and then it's on your machine. And then you can just open it up, and you can have insiders and regular code. So here I've got the insiders on my machine there, but I can also open up code side by side. And if you're into this, you can have two different themes running in both of them. So definitely something to check out. So once you install code, one of the things that a lot of people like to do is they like to be in some kind of a terminal. And maybe in the terminal, they'll go ahead and they want to be in a folder, like I've got this folder called Play. And in there, I've got a folder called Node 101. And maybe I want to open up an instance of code. Well, you can actually set it up so you can have a key command here that opens up code. I set up a bash command so I can open up code by typing C dot. By default, Visual Studio will, uh, code will allow you to do this. So if I hit C dot here, up pops Code Insiders, which is my default, with that project right in the same machine. This is super handy. I use this all the time. There's probably one tip you should take so far. It's that one right there. Now I'm going to show you our favorite command. And Burke, if they don't remember anything today, what do they have to remember? Command PP? Command Shift P. Command Shift P. Yes. I'm doing Command PP. That's yes. an actual thing. We'll get to it in a second. Yes. Command PP is great, too. Command Shift P. If you forget anything in VS Code, it brings up the command palette. And you can type things in there. For example, you can type in path. So you could say shell command install code insiders in the command path. That will allow you to type code dash insiders in your terminal to open up code. Or in the stable version of code, it will allow you to type code in terminal and open up whatever folder you're in inside of Visual Studio Code. So I've already done that on my machine, so that's where I am. Cool. And that's super helpful because when people tell me, they're like, Burke, just put it in your Bash profile. And I'm like, I don't know what that is. But I can go to the command palette and just click a menu entry. I'm like, look, I'm just like you. I know all about the terminal. Are you just like me, Burke? Well, I'm not just like you. <laughs> so there's another cool feature that's inside of VS Code that I want to show you all. Because sometimes new features come out, and it's hard to keep up with things. If you go to command palette again, command shift P, and I type in playground, there is an interactive playground that you can bring up. And the interactive playground allows you to learn some of the new features and not only read about them, but see them in action and try them right here. So I could go down to the background, and I can highlight using a multi-cursor, and I can type in Burke loves bacon, like that. And I can learn how to use features right inside of this playground right here in VS Code. If you haven't been through that interactive playground, I highly encourage you to go through it. Every line in there, you'll be surprised at how much you can master just from going through that interactive tutorial. Now, before we get too much further in tips inside of VS Code, I want to show you a couple things that you're going to see quite a bit. For example, you've seen us already have things like these different windows up in our machines. And let me open a folder 
I'm going to type in my password. It's one, two, three, four, five, six. Don't remember that, please. <laughs> very, it's so secure, John. I am very secure. So here's a folder, and let's say I'm inside my project, and I've got this open over there, and I've got this open over here. It gets like a little crowded sometimes. You're gonna see different things happen. The thing on the left over here, that's our sidebar, this explorer. I can make it come and go pretty quickly with the command keystroke, and Burke's gonna show you that in a moment. This thing in the bottom, that is our bottom bar. And in there, we've got our terminal and our output and other things. We can make that come and go. We can also see we've got multiple files going on. You can have multiple files in multiple panes. For example, let's say I had index on this side and package JSON over here. I can actually change the cursor by hitting Command-1 or Command-2, going back and forth between those two different files. Let's say I wanted to maximize looking at my package JSON. I can drag it all the way over, and I can maximize it. Now, if I hit Command-1 and I want to see everything in the index file, it automatically snaps over and shows maximized view of the other pane. So I can make them do push-ups like this and they can fight each other. And I can do Command-3 and go to another file. This project doesn't have a lot of files. Yep, there we go. But we can do it that way. And as long as you drag one pane all the way to the side, one split bar, now as you go through them, you'll see how they maximize as best they can. How do you close a single file? Command-W, Command-W, Command-W. And my favorite command, personally, is command pp. So whenever you want it to go back to the S file, you do command pp. So I'm inside of index.js. Now I had what file before? Package.json. What if I want to go back to command to the uh, index.js? I hold command, I hit p once, p twice, let go, and it goes back. So anytime you have to go, what do you do? Command pp. All right. So we showed you kind of what all those do there. Uh, another cool thing is, and this is a feature in Sublime that's had for a while, and, and VS Code's got it as well. Have you ever just needed to write notes real quick? Like you say, you know what? Don't forget to tell Burke to shave his head. You know, you've got something like that. He has headers. Don't forget to tell Burke to shave his <laughs> headers. Now, I haven't saved this file. How do I know that? Because it's got untitled one, and there's this big circle up there, which is a universal symbol for you didn't do what you're supposed to do. So in that file, I didn't do that. Well, if I close VS Code, it's like, uh-oh, what happened? Did I lose that? Now if I open it back up, let's see what happens. I'll zoom in a little. The file's still there. This is because there's a feature turned on in VS Code called Hot Save. So if I go down here, there's a hot exit feature, and I've turned this on. As Burke showed us before in settings, I can click on this, and I can say on exit or on windows close. You can see over on the right, I've got mine set to on exit, which allows me to save that file. Uh, some people like this feature in, v in uh, WebStorm and in Visual Studio. It's called Minimap. There's a thing here called uh, Editor Minimap, but I've got mine turned on to true. So if I open up a file like index.js, and let's go to Minimap right there, we'll set it to true. I come back over, you can see over here on the right, there's like a Minimap of that file, it lets you scroll through it. I happen to like my screen real estate, so I keep mine off. You just change that inside of your editor, and it just instantly disappears. Other stuff that you can do. Burke already showed us how we can do font family. So you can type in font family, and you can put them in here. Uh, notice that my font family is right now fear of code. I happen to like operator mono. All you have to do is put it in the right order, and you can do it that way. It'll change that sequence. If you want to get kind of crazy, you can pick one like architect's daughter and then your code. Oh, it's not installed in this machine. It's not installed, it'll default to the second one. But your code will switch to whatever one is actually installed in the machine, starting at the left, moving over to the right. You got a long list of fonts there, man. I do, I like to play with fonts. I like the inconsolous one. It sounds like the sad font. Doesn't it? It's inconsolable. Yeah. That was a terrible joke. Yes, You're it welcome. Was. So uh, the last thing I want to show you is a feature I like. A lot of times I want to get things out of my way. Well, there's a feature called Zen Mode. If you type in Zen inside the command palette and you go hit that, everything else disappears but your code, which is super cool. You can still get to everything else, so I can flip around my code and do what I need to do with command PP and get back there. And when I want to get back out of it, I just go back up to the command palette, which is command shift P, and I can toggle the mode and get right back out. Nice. So now the moment of truth. Is Burke's computer finally going to work? Let's see. <laughs> It's just not meant to be. I should have got a PC. That's the problem. 
Um, all right then, this will be interesting. Let's just keep right on going. Yeah. I'm gonna just gonna mess your demos up from start to finish. That's fantastic. This, it'll Burke. just be a downhill slide all the way. Okay. <laughs> it, yeah, it, let's see, that's, that's a good question. I may have a Google cluster for you if that's correct. Let's try extend, go back over again. Let's try it again. Go back over. Oh, not, nope. Here, maybe, here, right there. Nope, denied, just not happening. Nope. All right, no problem. So I'll tell you what, let's just do this. We'll continue over here on uh, Johnson. Machine. Yeah, I don't know that I have that connector type though. Okay, yeah, all right. Hey. I have a Mac and so you need a dongle to do anything at all. I have if nine If only of we knew something here. about technology. I know, exactly. Are there any developers in the room? Is there a doctor in the house? So let's do this. Let's come over to uh, one of your projects here. Do me a favor, John, if you would, pull up a, one of your fabulous Angular files that's got uh, more than one or two functions in it so we can take a look at how we can use navigation to go through uh, some more complex code files. So one of the ones that you can use that's really, really nice, um, we talked about the command palette, which is command shift P, uh, is you can use the command palette to navigate through your code. And there's a couple different ways that you can do this. So first you do command shift P, and that's gonna bring up the command palette. And you'll see here that we have a relatively long file. There's just a lot going on here. And the longer your file gets, the harder it is to navigate through. So what you can do is you can do command shift P, and then you can use the at sign here, excuse me, the at, the, sorry, that would be command P, and then the at sign, and that's gonna just organize your code here into the different places like your methods and properties so you can just move between them. And as you mouse through, uh, you can go to the different I items in your code here. If you use a colon here, like this, it will now organize your classes, methods, and properties and group them up here in the command palette so you can easily jump between them. Another thing that you can do is you can just use the colon and that actually allows you to jump directly to a line number. And it tells you how many line numbers you have. So uh, you can go to, so when you go to line 32, we just hit 32 and boom, we navigate automatically to line 32. So that's navigating from the command palette with uh, the symbols. If you forget what those are, it's okay. You can do command P, and then you can just do a question mark. And it will tell you, here are all of the things you can do inside of this to navigate through your code. Uh, and that's just right there. Uh, another thing that you're gonna wanna do, and John did this before, but we should talk about this, is if there's one, another keyboard shortcut you remember besides Command Shift P, it would be Command B. And all that does is toggle the sidebar. It's a very simple one, but these are the fundamentals. You're definitely gonna wanna know how to do that uh, so that you can toggle the sidebar in and out there. Uh, let's do, let's talk about this lower pane. So John talked about the lower pane. He showed you where it was on the bottom there. This is something that you're gonna use a lot because there's a lot of stuff in there. The terminal is in there, the debug console, the output window is in there. Uh, and there are a couple different ways that you can navigate in and out of this section. One of them is you can just navigate directly to the terminal. And to do that, you use the control back tick, which is the, the little key above the, the tab there. I always like to say it's the key, I didn't know it was on my keyboard. Right, you're like, what yeah. is that? <laughs> I think it's called a tilde. So the control tilde key, and that will toggle you directly to the terminal. Now, there's another way to get to this part of the editor that's a little bit more useful. If you'll notice here, if I come over to problems and I click on this, of course, there are no problems because it's your code and it's perfect. All the, I know, you're just an amazing developer. That's how good you are. Uh, if I control back tick out of this and I'm like, oh, I want it, it took me to the terminal. It's not exactly what I wanted. So if you wanna just toggle the bottom screen instead of moving to the terminal, you can use Command J, and Command J toggles the window down and then toggles it right back up again. And it also remembers where you are. So if you're on the problem screen and you do Command J, brings it down, Command J brings it right back up and you're still on problems. So that's a good one to know because you're gonna be in that bottom section all the time. Another thing that we can do is we can hide different parts of the editor that we may not want to see. So in this case, uh, and it looks like John, you've already hidden your open editors here. Yes. Have you already got that? So you'll notice that John, uh, if you've used Visual Studio Code before, there's a, a setting uh, or a panel that'll be up here at the top. Let's just go to user settings here and see if we can find the one. And there's uh, open editors, I think is what it's called. Mm -hmm. Is that right? Yep. Open editors. So he's got open editors visible. He's got nine. So let's go replace in settings and let's change this right here. Where is it at? 
Command right, B. Let's, Command B. Let's see here. There we go. Got to remember how to collapse the sidebar here. So open editors. We we'll put it at the bottom there. Where to go? Where to go? Too many settings. Too many settings. Alphabetical. Is that what it is? Let's see. There it is. Thank you so much. I have another Google cluster for whoever shouted that out. Uh, so we can set this to, if we set this to zero, this will hide the open editors, which is over here on the side. Now, John's already done that, so you don't see it. Uh, but a lot of times, if, if you've used VS Code before, you know that it's up there. And if you don't want to see that, I personally don't use that open editor section a lot. You can use this tweak inside of your settings file to go ahead and get rid of that so that you don't have to see that. Again, this is all about just customizing VS Code so it looks exactly the way that you want it to look. So that's open editors inside of VS Code. Uh, the, another thing that you can do is you can hide recommended extensions. So if we go over here to our extensions, um, and John's already doing this as well. John, you've got your VS Code setup configured all, all correctly and all good. I don't have any tips here. So let's do um, recommended extensions. I think it's called, is it recommended? Yep. Recommended extensions. Um, you can also type ext at the end of it. It does a fuzzy search. Oh, does it? Oh. Space. Oh, okay. Recommended ext. There we go. Where are we, where we are here? Editor. I can recommend. Recommend. The recommended extensions ignore recommendations, and then there's extensions show recommendations only on demand. So if we click this and we set this to true, or excuse me, let's set it to false, and then save, and what that should do is show our recommended extensions over here on the side, uh, and it's not popping up, but usually you have a recommended extension setting right there on the left-hand side. Yep. And when you set that setting, it no longer shows the recommended extensions panel. And again, that's just giving you more real estate on the left-hand side so that you can successfully use your code editor the way that you would like to do it. The last thing I want to show you here before I turn it back over to John is something called code folding. Uh, code folding is a very, very helpful thing. I use this a lot in HTML. So you see these uh, pluses and minuses over here on the side? We can collapse these different sections like this in our code to give us more room. So if you have a large chunk of markup, like let's say you're using a bootstrap uh, nav bar because it's scientifically true that you cannot build a web application without bootstrap. So you're using bootstrap, you want to collapse something like that. Yes, it's perfect. So you can collapse uh, over here like this, and then you get more, more screen real estate. You can also toggle this from the command palette. And how do we open the command palette? Command shift P. Command shift P, yes. That's the one thing we should ask this every five minutes. Command shift P. They're going to be checking in at the airlines today going, sir, can I see your ID? Yes, command shift P. Right, exactly. So you can toggle here. If we toggle, uh, let's see here, let's do folding. And we can actually fold everything. We can do fold all, and that will fold everything on the screen, right? So it'll fold all of it and all the different depths. And you can also fold at specific depths. You can see here it's folded all the way down. You can fold recursively. So the code folding available through the command palette, a very powerful way to collapse the code and have only what you need on the screen uh, when you need it. Here's a bonus tip for code folding. Notice when Burke folded the code up here, you know what's going on because you see the line numbers. You can play tricks on your friends by turning off line numbers in VS Code, and then it looks like you just deleted all their HTML on them. That'll make them really happy. You can tell what we like to do around the office. All right, something else you can do inside of here. Imagine that you're looking at your code and you want to mess with your friends' heads, which you can tell we do quite a bit of. There's a nice feature called line height that I like to play with. So if you go to line height, if you just click on the pencil on the left, it's going to show me right where it is on the right. So remember Berg was looking for it over here? He knows that when you click over here, it goes right over to there. I've got mine set to zero, but what happens if I set this thing to one? Who says nice. having long files of 1,000 lines of JavaScript is a problem? I mean, but you on. can fit so much code on the screen this way. Yeah. Come code with me, everybody. All right. And how do you get out of there? Because like, I can't see the setting. I'm going to teach you a button you've probably never heard of. It's Control-Z. <laughs> Thank God that worked. <laughs> All right. So we're back in our editor. Something else, and we mentioned this earlier that we uh, both use quite a bit, is the embedded terminal. Burke opened it up with the control tick. A lot of times I'll be using a terminal, and we can zoom in over here. Oop, my settings are broken. What did you do to my settings? Sometimes your settings I are fixed broken. I fixed them. I made them better. I'm going to change you to a light theme, and you'll be good to go. Awesome. You'll thank me later. 
So I can type things in my terminal down below and I can see stuff over here. I can also open up a second terminal in here. Part way I can do that is I hit the plus sign right there. That says John open a new terminal. And then you can tell it's a new terminal because you can see in the drop down list there's two ZSH terminals that I've got going on. So this one I could do something like go to CD inside my terminal. I can flip back over here to the first one. I can kill them both by throwing them in the trash can. Uh, but what if I don't like to hit the buttons and I want to use the keystrokes? Inside of here with the control tick, I can also hit command slash. Command slash gives me a second terminal on the right. Sometimes you're working with Node and you're running a process on one side and then you need a second terminal. So this way you can open up two terminals if you want. Or if you're like Burke, you can open up three or four or five or I don't know how many. More terminals. I Eventually, terminals. it does something like this, which I don't know how you would ever possibly read all those terminals, uh, but they're there at this point. And how do you get rid of all those? It is that you can if you want to. Who doesn't want 42 terminals inside of VS Code? Come on. Oh, I do. Uh, wow, how many did I actually create? Look at that. All right, so back in here, what could I possibly do? Let's say that I wanted to run the matrix over here. So I could run the matrix inside of the terminal. Uh, what happens if, let's say, I've got some kind of a file open like this, and now I can't really see what's going on in the file uh, up there, but let's say my terminal was small and I wanted to see more of what's in the terminal. Command-Shift-P, I can do toggle, maximize panel, and it's going to give me a little more space. Now, Command-Shift-P, it remembers the last command, I just hit Enter and it goes back down. So whenever you just need a little more space to your terminal, you can toggle, maximize panel, and then make it go back down. So let's toggle it back up. I come back in here, and I'm going to open up a second terminal on the right, and then over here I'm going to use Burke's favorite thing, Kause, Burke, and you can run two different things side by side inside your code. Moo. Just do it in Starbucks, everybody will think you're super cool. That yes. Guy, that guy's Mr. Robot. <laughs> Anybody watch that show? Yeah, it's a great show, although it's super depressing after season one. And also, it's Christian Slater's not real. He's not real? I, no. He, he imagines him. Did, did I just spoiler alert? Uh-oh. <laughs> so sorry. Are we live streaming this? I'd just like to <sighs> apologize to everyone on the internet. Terrible. This is my life, everybody. <laughs> yes. This is what you get when you get to work with me. I, I text you spoilers in the middle of the day. So something else that you really should learn about, which I find really super helpful, is sometimes you're like, you know what, I'm used to hitting a certain keystroke combination inside of code, and it, uh, inside of other tools, and it just works. For example, let's say you're on Twitter, or another page like this, and you're like, you know what, I just want to refresh my screen. Hey, look, there's my buddy Max. And if I want to refresh inside the browser without touching the, the uh, mouse or the trackpad, how do you do that? F5 or Command-R. So in my case, I hit Command-R a lot, and it's refreshing Twitter. Hey, there's Simona. Hi, Simona. You're also on the big screen. And inside of VS Code, remember we said that VS Code is actually an Electron app that's running basically web code inside of it. So it's effectively like a browser. So sometimes you're like, you know what? I changed some settings, and things aren't really working right. And I, instead of closing it and reopening it, what you can do is go to Command-Shift-P. You can type in Reload Window, and you can select it. Well, I didn't like doing that, because it's Command-Shift-P, it's type reload, then hit Enter. I wanted to do is map it to my own keystroke of Command-R. So I hit Command-R, and it reloads VS Code for me. How did I do that, though? What I did is I went up to the key bindings, keyboard, and I go into, let's go to the file, and you're going to see all the available key bindings are on the left, and the ones that I have mapped for myself are here on the right. And I mapped Command-R to reload my window whenever the editor has focus. And you can do all sorts of stuff. Like you can see here, like killing all my terminal windows. I've got that there. You can switch all your code to uppercase with Command-Shift-U. Uh, I do a zoom reset. Everybody in the browser, do you ever zoom in in a browser like this or zoom out? Let's go see Simona's face really up close. There you are, Simona. Sorry. <laughs> so there's Simona's face. But in a browser, you can hit Command-0, right? Inside of VS Code, doesn't work by default, but you could come into here and zoom in, and then it commands zero. Uh, and I got to get rid of your bug, whatever you put in there. But then it would set it back to zero. Burke, we're up to tip 42. Here. Nice. All right, so we're going to try one more time, and I'm praying. <laughs> Somebody send in the AV gods to rescue me, please. What's that? 
It could be. Let's try that. Want to switch back, John, here, and let me just try to fix it again real quick. Uh, let's see here. Let's go to settings. Let's see if we can change the resolution. Uh, let's go to scale. Let's do 1600 by 900. Nope, that's not going to do it. 1280 by 720? 400 by 600? <laughs> All right, all right, all right. It just wasn't meant to be. All right, so the next thing that I want to talk to you about is something called Emmet. Who in this room has heard of Emmet? Just by a show of hands. OK, a few people, several people haven't. That's totally fine. Again, we're all at different places learning how to do different things uh, uh, with our editors, with our code. So Emmet is a way for you to compose markup very quickly uh, without having to use angle brackets. Uh, so John, if you could open me an HTML file or create me a new one, that'd be great. You want a new one? A new one would be fantastic. All right, here's a new Let's file. Just, yeah, start from scratch. Let's save this, Burke, as HTML. Burke, you're now an HTML file. Excellent. All right, so we have an HTML file here, and normally the way we'd create markup is open an angle bracket, type div, and then Visual Studio Code is smart enough to know uh, what we're doing, and it'll automatically close this div for us. But there's a quicker way to do this. What we can do is we can just type div and then hit tab, and it will do the same thing. Uh, another thing that we can do is we can use, uh, assign classes and IDs this way as well. So if we had a div with an ID of main and a class of also main, uh, you can see here that we have a tooltip and we have an abbreviation, and you can see that's what it's going to do when we expand. So I'll hit tab, and we get that exact expansion. Now you can compose a lot of complex markup exactly this way. So if we come over here and let's do something like this. So let's do uh, div.navbar, because again, we've already discussed how you cannot build an app without Bootstrap. And then inside of that navbar, we've got another div, and it's got navbar uh, items. Let's do like this. Uh, and then maybe at the same level, there's a UL, and inside of that, there's an LI, and let's say there's three of them. And let's go ahead and hit tab, and then you can see that it expands all of that out. Uh, with a typo that I made there. And then you can tab through each one of these and enter in the things uh, that you would like for your list items to have. So that's one way uh, to use Emmet. Now, you can also use Emmet inside of files like TypeScript files, uh, View files, and uh, React files as well, because React has JSX, Angular has templates, but you can also write it inside of the Angular file, uh, and view files just end with view. Now, Emmet doesn't work out of the box in those files, but we can add in language mappings for those things to make sure that they work. So we're back in user settings here. And by the way, when we do toggle into user settings, that's command comma is how we do that. And then we can come here and we can say, uh, again, Emmet dot include languages right here. And then we can just start mapping. So you can see right here it has markdown. So we can map markdown to a type that VS Code knows about. So it could be something like HTML. And now Emmet will work inside of markdown files. We can do the same thing. Like if we wanted it to work in Angular, we'd come over here and we'd say TypeScript, because that's what Angular files are. And we can map that to an HTML file type, just like this. So what's happening is I'm sorry? Oh, ex exclude languages. Should be include languages right here. Thank you very much. I do have a Google cluster for you as well. Include languages. So that's the way that works. Um, and you, so you can add in JavaScript and for JavaScript React and for view files as well. Uh, so that's how you make that work in the different files that you've got. Okay. Yep. There we go. Let's pull that out. So let's do this. Let's come back over here to my personally named HTML file. And inside of this, I want to show you some of the other things that Emmet can do. So let's go to the internet, and let's get one of these. Well, you can't copy a picture from Google, can you? Do you have any pictures in this uh, current project here? You have like a, an assets folder uh, with some images in it? Perhaps. And by the way, to find out if you've got any pictures or images, all you have to do is a Command P and then type in JPEG. Oh, nice. And you can find all your images. And all right. there's a picture of me, very tiny. <laughs> that is a tiny picture of you. All right, so we can see that this file here, jp.jpg, is 32 by 32. I don't know if you can see this. We'll zoom in. So you see it's 32 by 32. Now, a lot of times when we're creating markup here, so let's do Emmet. Um, you can do a whole page of markup with Emmet by just hitting exclamation mark, tab, and then you get a whole page of markup. So inside of this, let's say that we're creating an image tag here. So let's do IMG, tab, and then here, we would put our image source. So we can put, uh, I think it was SRC, what was it, John? Uh, dot slash SRC. Help me out, where are your, where are your images at? Let's find out. 
We'll go back there. It's in source assets. Source assets. So we should be able to just do uh, SRC assets. Is that the right path? Do I have that right? Uh, I don't think that's right, because Visual Studio Code would pick that up. Looks like we're going to have to go up to up uh, right there, app, and then inside app, assets right there. So we're going to have to go up a couple levels. So let's just keep doing that until we find it here, which is a really nice thing about VS Code is that you can just go up, and then it shows you, here's your folders. We'll go up again. Here's our other folders. So we should be able to come down and one more. One more. Yep. Let's do dot, dot, slash. And we go to assets. And here's all of our images inside. I think we said jp.jpg. There we go. Uh, but what you're going to want to do with your image tags is you always want to add a width and a height to your image tag. Because if you don't, uh, when you go to render this in the browser, it's going to render, it's, it's not going to reserve the space on the page for it. And one of the things that's always a pain for me is that I don't know how big my images are. So then I have to go find out and then manually put them in. And so I tend to just not do it. So one of the things that Emmet will do for you is automatically update the size of your image in your markup. So for instance, all we have to do is come here at the end of the tag, Command Shift P, correct? Only one person, Command Shift P. And then uh, we'll do Update Image Size like this on Emmet, hit Enter, and boom. You can see right there, Width 32, Height 32, it automatically brings it in. Now this is a really, really cool tip because this doesn't just work inside of your project with local small pictures of John's head. This also works with images that are out on the internet. So if you're referencing a file via a URL, this will work there as well. Another place that it will work is inside of CSS. So if you're setting a background image and you have a local file or a remote file, you can specify that and it will automatically update your image size. So there's no more excuse to have image tags without an image size in. Emmet can do that for you. Another thing that Emmet can do is it can just straight up do math. So if we had, let's do, let's say we had 1,000 times 2.34 times divided by 10. Uh, we can highlight this right here and just say Emmet uh, math, just type math, evaluate expression, and boom, it evaluates the expression for you. So you don't, if, 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 you're, if you're using a calculator along with Visual Studio Code, you really don't need to do that. You can do all of this right inside of the editor. And a lot of this, most of this, is powered by Emmet. You're not going to remember all of the Emmet shortcuts and abbreviations. That's OK. There is a cheat sheet for Emmet that you can go out on the internet, just Google it. And what I would do is just print it out and then just start using Emmet uh, as best you can, and then you'll begin to learn the shortcuts as you go along, and you'll be a much more productive developer. Yes. Cool. Git. Undo all changes. <laughs> I didn't even know I had a tiny picture of me there. That's like really weird. Why, why is that there? Is it like the favicon or something? Don't, probably, yes. That's what I need is your picture there. on all my browsers. I was, at, I was at an event recently, and it was a, it was a Viking. So. My little tiny pictures. Or if you know who Ward Bell is, you get a nice little picture of Ward Bell in there. All right, so what comes up next? Uh, organizing imports. One of the things I like to do inside my code is I like to have, this is a hero's application, and you'll notice I'm doing pattern matching here, looking for files. I know I have a file that's a TypeScript file, and it begins with the word hero. And I know it's like got list in it somewhere. So I can type in hero list like this, and notice it's doing a pattern match. Even though the dash wasn't in there, let's say you don't know how to spell hero, you just let's say it's her list. You can find it here. I do this a lot. I can say, I know there's an HTML file called hero list somewhere. I can go find that pretty easily, too. So it's a very, very quick way to find your files. Command P, patch, um, partial file matching, and I can go check out a file. Now, when I scroll back out of here, and let's go find a file that's got more stuff in it. I think this one has a couple imports at the top. Let's say that in your file, you've got a lot of spaces going on. Uh, you've got multiple lines, somebody got to your code, and this is probably really upsetting Burke. I know he's got like a big problem with spacing. So. Yeah, tabs or spaces? That's, thank you very, I didn't hear a single tabs. I'm so proud of everybody here. I heard someone say spabs. Single quotes or double quotes? Single. Single quotes, yes. Wow, we're all on the same page. I like it. So let's say you've got your code in here and you're looking at it. If you press save, watch what's gonna happen to my code. Doop, boop, boop puts it up there. There's a feature called Organize Imports. It does not make that noise. That was me. <laughs> I don't want to use it then. Yes, exactly. If you type in organ, it will find 
Different features over here on the side. It's not finding them there. Let's go find them. Why is it not finding them? Do, 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 do. Well, there's a feature in there called Organize Imports. Uh, so we can go in there and set that feature on. It will automatically get rid of your white space. It'll format it using whatever formatting code settings you have in your project, which we'll look at next, and it will alphabetize the imports inside your code. You can also turn that off if you want to. This is a feature that I believe, uh, Brian Clark, is this in the stable yet? Yes, it just hit stable recently, correct? Organize imports. Uh, if you're wondering who I'm asking, Brian Clark up here does a monthly release on VS Code, which is one of our tips that we do. Yeah, you should check that out. It's only two minutes long. So in two minutes, you can get all of the newest features in VS Code. And VS Code ships a lot of new features every month. So by the time you watch this two months from now, you know, half the features that are new, you won't know about. So you definitely want to check out those videos so that you can stay up to date on that. So Google Brian Clark and VS Code, and you will find those. Uh, one of the things I like to use is Prettier. So who has fights at their office a lot on, oh, you know, I don't like the way you formatted the code. I like 80 character widths. I like 120. I like commas. I like semicolons. I like Burke. I like John. I mean, that happens at your office a lot. If you don't want to fight about this stuff, use a formatting tool like Prettier. Prettier is a tool that's uh, very well used on the web, and it allows you to set up your own formatting structure. So there's a file that you can create called a Prettier RC file in your project. I don't have one because I use the defaults, but there's an extension you can download. So if you go Prettier over here, and I'll make this a little wider, you can see the code formatter here. It's only got 2 million downloads, so a few of you obviously need to go grab it too. When you install this in your machine, it'll use a bunch of settings. You can use a prettier RC file, which is just JSON, where you can change it from max, uh, character, max line width from 80 to 120 to 150, whatever makes you happy. Uh, spacing around brackets and things. It's really, really nice. It, you check that into your source control, and then you have no more fights on your team about who's going to format what anymore. Right, but you can still fight about JSON versus JSON. JSON or JSON? Jason, it's Jason. Who said Jason? The A is implied. You can't make it. You can't make up pronunciations. I just did. We're going to have a debate about all of this stuff later on at the Channel 9 stage this afternoon, where we're going to talk about all of these different very important developer problems that have to be solved right now. Yes. Like how you all mispronounce Jason, just like that. That would be a nice thing to see everybody do. The other thing that I want to show everybody here is we are also doing format code. So how do you format your code? If you do format like this, you have options for formatting on paste, formatting on save. You've also got a formatting timeout that you can wait for it. I like to have a format code setting in my project. But if you forget these things, Command, Shift, P, you type in format document, and you can see the keystroke to go do that. And that will format your, co your document based upon your prettier settings or any other settings you have inside of your project. Now, Burke, there's one bonus that we should mention here. Notice that every time that I type some code in here, there's no little circle in the upper tab. Didn't I mention earlier that there's a little circle there any time you change your file and you haven't saved it? Have you ever written code and then run it? And you're looking at it and you're like, why isn't this taking effect? Because you didn't save the file and it usually takes you a couple minutes to realize that? Well, there's a nice setting that you can set in the menu, File, Autosave. And I like to check that on. Why? Because I do a lot of demos and a lot of coding, and I don't want to have to hit Command S all day long. So with autosave, it'll automatically save my code on a delay. What kind of delay does it have? Well, if you type in autosave, you'll see down here, oops, there's an autosave. By default, it's off. You can turn that on. So if I click on this, you'll see where mine's set over here. Mine's after delay. What is my delay? It is 1,000 years. Those are milliseconds. <laughs> so after 1,000 milliseconds, it's automatically going to save my code. And I love to do this, especially in JavaScript and Node. So it saves my files. My tests will rerun, or my Angular review project will automatically rebuild and just launch inside the browser. Back to you, Burke. Nice. All right. The other thing I want to talk about in VS Code is IntelliSense. Now, I'm sure most people are aware that VS Code has IntelliSense. Uh, IntelliSense has been around for a while. I did hear somewhere that Sublime Text was the first one. To, I thought it was Visual Studio, but it, Sublime Text is the first one to do IntelliSense. I may be wrong. Uh, but one of the places that you may not know that VS Code can do IntelliSense is in uh, JSON, JSON files. 
It works in JSON files. It also works in JSON files. So let's go over to, to our user settings. So we've been in this file a lot today, and there, we've got tons of user settings. You picked up one thing, it's that you're going you're gonna to tweak user settings a lot. So let's come down, and, and when we're looking for another setting, we can hit the quotes like this, and then all of our settings appear over here to the side. So VS Code knows about what all the settings are, and then it also knows what all of the options are on this side. And this is powered by the IntelliSense in VS Code. Now, this may not be much of a surprise to you, but this also works in places that you wouldn't normally expect and in ways that you might not normally expect. So let's do this. Let's take this out. Go ahead and save that, mess your project up royally. And then <laughs> let's look for a package JSON. I'm sure you've got one of those. All right, we got our package JSON open. You got a, quite a few things in here, John. One of the things, though, that you probably don't know about VS Code is that IntelliSense works inside of package.json files. So yes, it works for stuff up here like this, where you have your name and your license and the scripts and the repos, so you can just quotes and then it'll tell you what all those things are. You're not gonna fill them out anyway, so that's fine. Uh, so let's just go ahead and take this off. I like it when you initialize a new NPM project and it's like author, repo, description, and then you just go through all of it and then it says tests and it's like none because I don't need any tests in my project, so just none. Why does it ask you about tests? What are tests? Yeah, exactly. Tests are for demos, not for real life. All right. So let's go down under dependencies here. And one of the things I want to show you is under dependencies, we've got all of our NPM packages. Now, you don't normally hand edit your package.json file. Normally, you NPM install, you pull in a package. But if you had to, for some reason, I find myself every now and again needing to hand edit this file, you can come down here. And if you, if you press Control Spacebar, it will go out to NPM. And it will look at all the different package, packages that are available. So obviously, we're going to want to use CoffeeScript because it's 2011. And uh, so we're going to want CoffeeScript. But what version of CoffeeScript do we need? Well, we don't know. At this point, you'd have to open a browser, go out to NPM, check what the current version is. You don't know, do I need a squiggly? Do I need that caret? What the heck do those things even mean? Nobody knows. Uh, but you can let VS Code handle this for you by coming in here to the quotes and hitting Control Spacebar. And it will automatically go out to NPM and detect the latest version of the package. This is a really, really powerful tool because it allows you to keep context and state where you are inside of your editor without having to bounce around to check different things. And again, you can summon IntelliSense at any time with control spacebar. So this works right inside of JSON files. This is NPM IntelliSense. While we're talking about NPM, I also want to talk about something from uh, Eric Gamma. We've mentioned him a couple of times. He wrote a package called NPM. So you can install an extension called the NPM extension from eGamma. And that does a lot of different things. Like it adds a bunch of options, menu options, to your editor. So you can, if you type in NPM, you can see that I've now got run, install dependencies. Uh, and then it also has all of my NPM scripts right here uh, within the command palette. So I can run a build. Uh, I can run test. I can just do run start. So you can control all of your NPM actions directly from here. The other thing that it will do is that it's very, very smart about knowing which packages uh, you have and are using in your project, and if you have a discrepancy in your package.json file. I see you've upgraded to Angular 6. I have. How did that go? Well. Wonderful. All right. <laughs> so uh, I'm just going to go ahead and completely break this. So let's just say he's on version 5.2.0. We'll just go ahead and save this. It's OK. I don't need to demo Angular. Yeah, it's fine. No, nobody's going to look at that. Um, and then you can see here that it's telling us that uh, we have an invalid package installed here. So this is the NPM module that's telling us you're referencing a version that you don't have. So that it can, it can smartly look through your folder, look through the dependencies that you have, and then visually tell you if you have any problems. How many times have you opened a project and then tried to run it and gone, it doesn't work? And they're like, oh, I didn't do an NPM install. This package will, or extension will help you by uh, showing you visually what's going on there. So if I opened up this file and I had like 100 green squiggly lines in there, that'd be a great indication of I need to run npm install. Exactly. Um, and then the other thing that this package will do uh, is, uh, I think we already went over allowing you to launch your commands. One of the things that I wanted to show you uh, that's sort of an NPM hack, not really to do with Visual Studio Code, but Elijah Manor showed me this, and it changed my life. 
because it's the simplest thing in the world. So I'm going to go to a terminal session. Remember, we can do control back tick there to open that up. So if we wanted to do, I tell you what, let's do, I'm going to go up a directory. Let's do a new directory. Oh, I'm going to get directory now. That's weird. So let's do directory Burke, and then we'll uh, move into Burke. And let's say we want to initialize a new project in here. So we would do npm init. And then it's going to start asking us a ton of questions. And normally, we just do this right here, right? We're like, whoever okay. answers all those questions. Right. Uh, and, and, and I'm done. Right? I do this almost every single day. So let's do this. Remove that file. What we can do instead is we can just say npm init dash y enter. And boom, it just answers all of them for you. So everybody thank Elijah Manor for that tip. That's directly from him. That will save you a ton of time. So that's IntelliSense inside of package.json files. That is the NPM module, and that is an extra special bonus tip just for uh, creating your package.json files. Thank you, Elijah. Uh, I don't know what you changed again. Let's go undo that. That's going to be a habit today. There we go. By the way, I got a little green underline there, right? It's saying, hey, Angular Commons extraneous. Um, it's not, actually. Is that like an opinion that it has about it's, Angular Commons? It's definitely got an opinion. It's like, today I don't like you. So one thing you can do in here, man, is remember, you can reload the window. So I can hit Command-R, reload it, and let's hopefully make sure the squigglies go away. Sometimes that kind of thing happens. Seems OK right now. So Burke just created a file, right? Inside of, was it Burke? Yes. All right, so let's go, oops, that's not where I wanted to be. Down here, let's go back, and let's go inside of Burke. That's really scary. So I'm looking inside your head. Yes. I'm scared. There's not much there. It's like the Lego movie. Yes. <laughs> and then we're looking, we see a package JSON. But maybe I wanted to load that in this project. Remember, I, I could type in code. I have a shortcut for C because I'm really efficient. It's 25% of the time to type it. So I type in C, and I could do C dot. That would open up a new instance of code because this is just a terminal. What if I want to stay in this instance? I can do dash R. That means I really want to stay here. So I can type that, and it's going to go open that folder in this instance of VS Code right here. So you're not opening a second instance. So there's flags on this that allow you to launch the same thing. And if you look through here, I only have one instance of VS Code running. And you can see, hey, there's Simona again. Hi, Simona. Up and on my machine. So now I want to get back into there. I can go back into my terminal. And we're going to go back out. We're going to go into my Git folder. And then I can also do. I forgot what it was called. Who was it, Vikings? Yeah. That was Vikings. Do that. I can do C dot dash R. Go back in. It's going to reload. And one other thing to show with NPM, which I find wicked cool, is a relatively new feature. Notice there's this thing called NPM scripts. You've got to say it like that. This is going to show you all the scripts that are inside your package JSON. And then you could run these things like, hey, tests. I bet you they don't work. But I could right click it, and I could choose run. And it's going to go ahead. Open up a terminal. It's going to run my tests. I'm pretty sure they're all going to fail, because I have not changed them for Angular 6 yet. But it's going to run over there. But that's kind of nice, because alternatively, what would we do? We'd open up the terminal, run npm test, do it ourselves. Or, and I'll kill this one here, boom, boom. Or we could go up to npm run script, and we could choose test right from the menu. So there's multiple ways to solve the same problem. It really depends on how you like the role. If you like the keyboard, track, uh, keyboard you can use the commands. You can use the terminal, or you can use the trackpad and right click over here inside of your NPM scripts. Yeah, so you can see how we're just sort of moving the slider. This whole session, we've just been moving it from text editor, and we're moving closer and closer and closer to IDE. So as we move closer to IDE, I want to talk about some features that you're going to find more inside of an IDE, because that's the direction that we're headed here. One of the things that I always loved about Visual Studio I was a, a .NET developer for a short time, and I was a terrible one. And you're all lucky that I don't do that anymore. But, but one of the things that I really liked about Visual Studio was that the database tooling was right inside of the IDE. You didn't really need to go to the management studio. It was just there. So if you wanted to run a query, if you wanted to create a table, if you wanted to test, all of that was there. And that's really the defining feature of an integrated development environment is that all of the development things that you need are integrated in. And so one of the things that you can use inside of Visual Studio Code is something called the Cosmos DB extension. Now, the Cosmos DB extension connects to Azure Cosmos DB. It was a lot about that in the keynote. It's a fantastic database. But one of the little known things about Azure Cosmos DB, or the extension, rather, is that it will connect to any 
MongoDB instance that you have. So in this case, John's got one running his local host here. You can see that. But this will connect to any, any Mongo installation running available on the MongoDB slash slash colon slash slash protocol. And there's no security, so you can hit any database in the entire world. That's right. Look at you. You have We're the keys, the keys to the kingdom. We're kidding. And then you can see your uh, collections inside of that. So if we click on this, we can see the different documents. If I was to right click on this and say open collection, we can see all of the data over here on the other side. Now that's really nice. It allows us to move through our data. But remember, we talked about having an integrated development environment where you can do things like test queries. So a lot of times when we're developing against the database, we need a tool that allows us to go in and write and test our queries. We can do that inside of Visual Studio Code. So Command Shift P opens the command palette. And we're just going to look for a Mongo scrapbook. So I'm going to do new Mongo scrapbook here. And you can see over here on the side that it says that we're connected right here to this MongoDB instance. So at this point, we're just using straight MongoDB. And we can come over here on the side. I'm going to hit DB like this and a dot. And I get IntelliSense built into Visual Studio that tells me what my collections are. So we'll do the heroes collection here. And then I'll hit a dot again. And it tells me, here are all the Mongo commands that you can run against this collection, all within inside of Visual Studio Code. So I can do find like this. And then if I want to execute this, I've got a couple different options. I can do Command Shift P and just say execute command, execute MongoDB command like this. And there we go. Or Close that. Oh, let's not do that. Let's close this. We can do Command Shift and then double quotes, and that will do the exact same thing. So you can test out all of the different commands that you have, all of your different Mongo queries, without having to install a MongoDB admin tool, uh, all from within inside Visual Studio Code. And if you're using Cosmos DB, you get a whole host of other stuff as well, uh, things like access to the key value store and the graph API and things like that. There was a session, uh, Matt Hernandez did a session covering that in more detail. So if you missed that one, I think you should be able to check out the recording on that. And we have links to those other sessions Correct. at the end of the slides. Uh, yes. Very cool. Show that one? Yeah, we want to do that. Do you have a, a JavaScript file we can look at here? No, but you can make one. All right, sounds good. Actually, you know what? Let's do, you have, do you have functions installed? I want to talk about that one too. Yeah, Azure, Azure Functions. So this is another really cool one. Again, we're talking about making Visual Studio Code an IDE. So the Azure Functions extension is an extension for Visual Studio Code that allows you to very, very easily work with Azure Functions, create them, run them, test them, debug them, and even deploy them. So in this case, if we wanted to create a new Azure Functions project, I can click on this folder here, and it's going to ask us where. So we'll just do a new folder here, and I'm going to, I'm just going to, sorry, John, I'm completely ruining your. I'm just going to watch so I know they will clean it. <laughs> it's called fun <laughs> functions demo. We'll select that. And then it, we're going to select a JavaScript function type here, because we've already talked about what a terrible C Sharp developer I am. You do not want me writing that. So we'll click that. And then it's going to go ahead, and it's going to create a new project for us uh, inside of that folder here. And then what we can do is we can come and create a new function uh, a new Azure function inside of that folder. And those Azure functions could be blob triggers or queue triggers or timer triggers. HTTP triggers are probably the ones that we use most often as web developers because we're uh, familiar with how to do that. So let's see, it did, let's see if we can open it here. Let's do open, let's see if we can find our, what's, what's it called, Vikings? And I think I put it inside of a folder called functions demo. There we are. So let's open that. Uh, we won't save any of that. There we go. So now our functions project is open here. And if we wanted to create a new function, just come down to our, what do they call these things? Are these called, uh, Chris, what's the name of these little sections here? Explorers. Explorers. Down to this, I always call them the wrong thing. I'm like, this panel, this blade. No, that's not right. Explorers. Click the little lightning bolt. And we'll say that we want to use the current folder that we're in. And then wants to know, well, what sort of a, a trigger do you want? We'll say we want to do an HTTP trigger like this. And we'll just call it hello build like this. We'll do anonymous because who needs security? And then we've got a function here. And we can go ahead and run this by coming to the debug, hitting the play button. And this will go ahead and fire up our function locally. And then we can just click. Let's go back to our terminal. You'll see the uh, URL here. And we can just hit it like this. And boom, you're already writing Azure Functions. That's all you have to do to create an Azure Function. That's all you have to know. And then when you're ready to actually publish your Azure Function, 
let's disconnect this. You can just come over here to your section in Azure Functions down here, and you can just hit this button right here, and you can deploy directly from Visual Studio Code, and you can cr also create your functions project directly from Visual Studio Code. So this is a really, really powerful way to work with the different features in Azure. There's also extensions for App Service. There's extensions for Azure Storage Explorer or Azure Storage. There's extensions for Functions. We talked about that. We talked about Cosmos DB. Am I and missing any? Docker. Which Docker. There's a Docker extension as well. Yes. I'll be doing a session later this afternoon showing a lot of these different uh, Azure-based and Node-based extensions, building a Node app, I think around 115. OK. Um, and we have, I think, just two or three more things that we needed to show you. Uh, one, I want to show the bonus one, just make sure we get time yeah. to do this one in here. So this literally is hot off the presses. Let's see if this works. I created a new project. Burke doesn't even know what I'm going to do. What's he going to do up there? Oh my god, it's so amazing. So I've got this fascinating project called Node 101. It's a really, really big project. It's got a single file, and it's a Node server. That's it. So inside of this file, I could run this, right? I could just go down here, and I could type in node server.js. And that's not the name of my, pro my file. It's called node index.js. <laughs> it's listening on port 3000. I can come up to here. I can type in localhost 3000. We'll zoom in, and you can see, yay, look. It's not really on Azure yet, but you get the idea. So we've got our node server here that we can run. But what if we want to debug it locally? Well, Burke, how do we debug locally? by creating a launch configuration. A launch config. So I can hit this debug thingy over here, which is a bug with a slash through it, and I can just do run, right? And it's thinking. There we go. There we go. Hey, it's like connection has been refused. So. I can debug my stuff through here by launching up my index file. In this case, it's running start debug. Why is it having a problem? Hmm, it's looking for start debug. So I go into my project. Notice I want to start with npm start. So I can run this by running npm start, but the secret feature I want to show is there's a new thing that VS Code is now in preview, and I believe the blog post is coming out today or tomorrow, Chris, on this? Yes. Uh, Chris is the guy who owns this whole thing. So anything that failed today is his fault. Everything that worked right. is Burke's. Right. My, the reason why my laptop wouldn't show up on the screen, that's Chris. Thanks yes. a lot, Chris. Yes. Because <laughs> VS Code can't do that yet for some reason. Uh, so inside of here, there's a new feature where you can actually deploy your app to Azure and then debug it from VS Code. Think about that for a second. You can write your code here, deploy it to Azure, and then debug it right from VS Code. So I had something open up here. I think I called it node, build node 101 Azure websites. Let's zoom in because that's way too small. This is a live site. You can all hit it. It's an amazing website that I wrote up on Azure. And if I wanted to debug this, what I could do is I have to set an NPM script, and I'm calling it start Azure debug. It's just a convention we're using right now. You can name it whatever you want. I've then told Azure that this is what it's going to run, so it knows to run that. And I'm not just running node index. I'm running it with the inspection flag, so it knows it's going to use the debugger. And there's a special environment variable here that we're going to set. This is all going to be explained in a blog post that's going to be coming out soon and how this works from the app services team, too. So when I set all of this, then what I can do is come back to my project. And you notice, I have some options here. I could deploy to a web app. I've done that. You just saw it actually running. Well, now, over in the Azure pane, I've got the app service extension. I could open up John Papa. Hey, we opened Burke before. And inside of here, you can see I've got build node 101. If I right click on that, there's a new feature down here called start remote debugging. Who wants to try it? Yeah. Chris, it's going to work, right? <laughs> <laughs> he says, I hope so. This has literally just happened. And look at that. We've got a debugger. And we hit a break point. Woo! Nice. But wait, there's more. So we're inside of here. And notice we're stopped here. But I'm trying to inspect res and stuff. And I want to break inside of this. It broke inside of an asynchronous callback. That's really cool. So normally, when you want to break inside one of these callbacks, you've got to change your code, put curly braces there, and then go back and put the breakpoint. I've done that. What would have to happen then is I'd have to save my code and redeploy it to Azure and then retry it. And I don't really want to do that. So we can right click inside of our code, and then we can choose this option down here add a column breakpoint. 
I've already selected that, and that's why it's changing it there. So now I can see the message is hello from Azure. I can come over here to my code. I could change, get rid of some of these guys. I could come down to my code, and I could look through, and I could change the request. I could let it run through. And if I want to, I can change the message, and we could change what happens up top. That's pretty cool, and it's guaranteed to work. Chris Diaz said so. You just saw it. <laughs> Not something I think I would do for production code, but if I wanted to bug something live on Azure, super easy, because, hey, every time you run code locally, it always works on another machine, right? Yeah. So, Burke, we have one last tip. What you got? We talked about this thing called a multi-cursor. Have you ever had a project, let me go back to my Vikings, have you ever had a project where you wanted to grab something out of someone's package JSON, and you wanted to just grab just what those packages were? Like, maybe I want to grab just the Angular stuff here, and I want to go install those. So what I could do is I could grab all of these files here. I'm going to open a new file with Command N, just an empty file. I'm going to paste. What I really want to do is end up with something that looks like npm install, and then all of those packages. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to go through, and I'm going to highlight whatever I see is co uh, common throughout them all. Maybe they're not all starting with Angular. In this case, they are. But I'm going to grab the quote, com uh, colon, space, quote, and I'm going to hit Command D, and you'll notice the cursor is moving down the line, finding every match that I've got. I can then delete those. I'm holding Command, Shift, right arrow, go to the end of the line, deleting those. Command, left, deleting the comma at the beginning. Now I'm going to go to Command, right, to go to the end. I'm then going to put a space in there. I can go back. I can now go to the end of the line, front. And now I can go ahead and space them all out. Go to the end, and I can type in dash, save. Now you can send that command to your friends. You can run it at a terminal, copy and paste it, and do it. This is super powerful. It's called a multi-cursor. It allows you to edit multiple lines of code all at the same time. And it's one of my favorite features uh, that was in Sublime. And I wouldn't use VS Code until it was there. And these guys put it in, and it's pretty awesome. All right, let's flip back to the slides. This red light's blinking. My anxiety level's going through the roof. All right. <laughs> Because we're out of time. Where do they go to find all these tips? Uh, we've got, so first of all, the slides are going to be available. All of the tips that we gave you are going to be in image and GIF format in the slides. So you don't have to remember any of this stuff. Just know that you can do it. Go back and research on your own time. Here are all of the different resources that we've got for you uh, in terms of VS Code, the Angular Essentials Package from John, the Extensions Marketplace, Node Extensions. Everybody took their pictures, their grainy pictures. All right. Uh, there's a lot of Visual Studio code at Build. So if you're interested in more, here's some of the other sessions that we've still got that you can go to. I'd recommend checking those out. There's going to be a lot of Visual Studio code for the next couple of days. We'd like to thank you for joining us this morning. You had a lot of, a lot of choices.